This time I've got a device that I've never worked on before. I've actually only seen one of these units. And this is how rare it is. It's a RCA Selectivision CED video displayer. They're on the market only for a couple years and then RCA recalled them all, ran a bulldozer over them and uh, burned all the discs. Anyway, I got one here to look at. Let's check it out. Many of you probably remember these. This, of course, is a laser disc. A 12 inch optical disc, the predecessor to the compact disc audio disc. And on laser discs, they would put a movie or video on an optical disc. This was actually what was eventually became the compact disc followed by the DVD and then the Blu-ray. But this was the first optical playback format that we had for consumer use that had commercial success. The first disc format. But it wasn't the only disc format. There was another disc format that was out prior. Well, I shouldn't say prior. There was another disc format that was brought out. Development started much earlier. I think the development started back in the mid-60s, I guess, in 70s. And it finally arrived to the market in the 1980s. And most people don't even know what I'm talking about. If you're old enough, you will remember RCA's Selectivision video discs. This was a commercial failure. And this one product probably bankrupted RCA, or at least put them damn close to being bankrupt, to the point where they were bought out by Thompson Consumer Electronics, and it was all downhill for RCA from then. Prior to that, RCA was I think, the number one spot in television sales in North America, and they held a huge market in VHS sales as well. I have one of these special disc players that are about as rare as hen's teeth these days, when they were released in the early 1980s, is there a date on this? 79, but I don't know. I think that the, the disc probably came out early 80s. Um, it did not do well. It actually flopped. And I worked at an RCA dealer at the time. Uh, we, the shop that I worked at starting in 84 was uh, RCA and Sony and Panasonic dealer, we were a Sony service center. And we had these players in the store. They didn't sell. We actually rented the movies as well on them and they, they just didn't rent. Why? Because you could record on VHS tape and you could rent movies on VHS and Betamax tape at that time. There was no room for a disc-based format that provided no improvement in picture quality over VHS and had no special features. You couldn't freeze it, you couldn't scan. I guess you could scan, but not really well. It was just a, a god-awful format. This is a vinyl record in here, believe it or not. And we'll show you the record, I'll show you this. It's It comes in a caddy, and you put it into the player, and you play half, well, let's show you the player. I've got a player here, I've never repaired one of these. One was brought to me to see whether I could do anything for it. I, I told the fella, I said, you know, I've never worked on one of these machines before. I saw them on display in this store that I worked in, but um, we didn't sell any, or very few. And what RCA did was when they killed the product, they bought all the inventory of discs back from the stores. That's why the disc disappeared so quick because nobody wanted to be stuck with dead inventory. So anything that wasn't open, like the, the discs that we had opened and we were renting, we, we sold those off. We sold them off for a dollar or two a piece to people that had, the few people that had bought players. Uh, the rest of the ones that were unopened, they all went back to RCA to be crushed or shredded or whatever. All the players that remained in the store, they all went back as well. And that was the end of that disaster. So this is what's called a CED, or Capacitive Electronic Disc System. This is a door, I believe, on the top that you can open. And there's a, there's a stylus in here that you can change. I just forget how to do it, but there is a stylus in here that you can pop out and change. Because this uses a stylus like a regular record. 
to read information that's carved into or pressed into grooves. But unlike a vinyl record where the an audio disc where the, the needle actually moves back and forth in the groove, in this case it's what's called a capacitive electronic disc. So yes, there is a groove that is pressed into the disc, but there's no lateral or vertical movement on the disc. What there is is there's a capacitance changed by I guess the, the depth the depth of the the actual groove itself changes but the stylus doesn't ride up and down it just sits in the groove and as the groove below it changes its depth it changes the capacitance that is picked up by the stylus that floats basically on top of it I'll show you the player I'll show you how these things work and then we're gonna see what, what this does and whether I can do anything to try to fix it I know it doesn't work I know that much here's the front of the player there's actually one of these up for sale right now on Facebook, and someone's asking quite a bit of money. They're asking a couple hundred dollars for it, which I would never pay. Uh, you know, if I could, if I could buy one of these things for ten dollars just to have as a as a collector's piece, I would do it. But I would not pay what someone's asking for it because obviously you can't get the movies anymore. There's very few movies out there. But basically, how this worked was, you loaded the disc. You had to have this handle down in the load position. You had a position play, off, and load. You opened that to load. And you put the whole cartridge in like this. And then you took the cartridge out. And what that's done now is it removed the disc and the disc is actually inside the player. Then you would move this up to play and that would lower the needle down and start it playing or off. You had visual scan, forward and backwards, rapid access, and it says play time and a pause button, but didn't, I don't think it gave you a frozen picture, just pause the picture. You moved it to play and then you could pause it and so forth. And then to remove the disc, you moved it back to unload. You put the disc in, you put the jacket back in, and it would now retract the disc. And then you turn it over to play the other side because each side only held, I think, each side held 60 minutes of, of, uh, of playing time. And then played it. And then when you're done, and if you put it in backwards, I don't think it would even accept it. It would not. Or would it oh it would you see now it says side two if you look at that so now it's backwards so it tells you what side it's on so I've now put it on backwards so you put it in with the, the correct side facing up so if I do that and then I put this back the other way I've now retracted the disc the disc is locked in here to protect it what holds the disc in place is there's little plastic tabs if we press these little tabs in we can release the disc and now you can see what's in here so let's take a look at this funky record I'm not going to pull it all the way out because I don't want it to get damaged but you can see that this is what the record looks like and this this just sits in the player the disc gets clamped and that's what's on the disc that's what's on this side the other side's probably got more on it well, I guess it doesn't look the same I guess it just plays this part of the disc you can see a color change here but you don't want to touch these discs because uh, fingerprints will get on them and, and destroy them and that's why they're kept in these caddies so you don't handle them if you look at it, look closely you can actually see where the uh, the sink you can see them it's actually I think f three frames three fields or four fields per revolution if we get a close-up here you can actually see just like when you look at a laser disc, if I can get the light right, there you can see it. See the reflection? There's your, uh, that'd be, actually that'd be the vertical sink. And they're all lined up because the disc runs at a constant speed, as you can see. You can actually see the individual lines of video. If I get a close-up shot here. And, and when you look at this, this looks like you're looking at a laser disc. It looks very much like looking at a laser disc when you look at the reflections, but this is actually a vinyl disc it's not using a laser at all it's using a, a mechanical stylus to pick up the information that's embedded in those grooves it's actually kind of neat the way that it works and had it been a success and hadn't flopped like it did we could have been watching movies on these discs because from a production cost it was much less expensive to press a disc like this than it was to make a laser disc. These were pressed almost exactly like they would have pressed the vinyl record of the day. 
for, for private home use only. No copying in whole or part. And like a record, it's got information on there that, they, that the engineer, when they cut it, would have carved into the actual stamper. And then when you put it back in, it just goes back into the, the shell like that. Let's uh, plug this player in and just see what it does. And incidentally, if you press it, there's a button on the back here. You press that button in and that should, I think, either, either press it or, and it will pop this open. I think you press it. Anyway, this is, this is supposed to release this door. So you can get at the, the needle to, to change it. Because you did have to buy a new needle from, from time to time and that's another problem. That's another reason not to collect one of these things, or if you collect one, don't think you're going to start watching movies, because the, the stylus on it was only good for a limited number of hours, and then it had to be replaced. It was not inexpensive when these players were being manufactured. The stylus itself was quite a bit of money. I forget exactly what it was, but it was it was a fair bit for a, a stylus. This, you got to remember, back in the day, you could buy a, a phonograph needle, for your turntable for about 20 bucks back then. And this, was, I think, was probably 60 or $80. Anyway, let me hook it up to the TV and see what we get, if anything. I thought I was gonna hook it, to, hook it up to my TV, but Houston, we have a problem because you see, this thing does not even have any AV outputs. It has channel three or channel four. It only has an antenna input, so I have to get a coaxial cable and put my TV on channel 3 or channel 4. All right, I get the high-tech coaxial cable connected. I will turn this thing on and see that I get a black screen on my, my television. That's right, no fancy menus. This has nothing. You turn it off, it'll pass the RF through from your antenna or your cable box or whatever. You turn it on and it is on and you have a black screen. I'm gonna load the disc now and we'll see what it does. We'll. Uh, Put it down to load. Load the disc. A little light comes on to say that there's a disc in it. Switch it to play. And it's actually trying to do something. Oh, it's not looking good. But it's trying. Oh. I remember this logo. It looks like we have a servo problem on this thing. And that's about all it does. Either that or something sticking. What if we scan, try to scan ahead? Will it scan ahead? Visual search. Okay, this thing's coming apart. We'll stop it from playing. That stops it. Okay, let's rip this thing apart. By the way, if I pop this open, there it is. There's the pickup. It says, unplug the player before replacing the cartridge. Let's take a look at the needle that this thing had in it. You open this up by doing that and here was the stylus that you had to change you just lifted it up and that's what played your record can we get a close-up of this thing so you think that the diamond tip was small on your uh, phonograph record player that played music there is the diamond tip for this one well uh, I'll grab my microscope so that you can actually see it here's a close-up view Record it with my microscope. I try to get a little bit closer. So that's there what we rides go. over the end of the. Uh... So that sits over top of the record itself. I'm gonna try to get a couple of different angles here, but you can see there's the plastic tip and the metal cantilever. The uh, I don't know whether the tip is a diamond or a carbon. I think it was a carbon tip actually because it has to make an electrical connection with the disc so that it can read the capacitance that's that's pressed into the lower layers of the disc itself. 
the, the surface isn't actually a groove that it rides in. It just sits on top of it. And that's why the disc is in a caddy, because, of course, any dust or debris that gets onto the surface of the disc would interrupt that current flow. Or the capacitance change. There's actually no current that flows. But there is a, there is a, looks like a, like a cat whisker, very, very thin metal bar that goes on the back side of that, that pickup and physically connects it to the preamp on the, the, the player itself, which we'll see in a moment when I get a different shot. You can see it on the back side of it there. That's what the, the tip looks like. It's not actually a point. It's, it's, it's like a ridge that just sits over top of the disc and reads the information as the disc rotates below. To put things into perspective, look at the size of that hair or piece of lint compared to the tip of that stylus. That piece of copper foil is what connects the pickup to the preamp. You can see it there, a very, very thin piece of copper foil, which is bonded to that pickup that's out of focus. I'm focused on the copper band now. But that's what transfers the information from the disc to the preamp, which is connected to that electrode. Using the microscope, we get a closer look at the actual disc itself. I think these are kind of cool. Yes, there is a couple specks of dust on there, and that actually, pointing it out there, that actually will cause it to skip or to stick on that groove or that track and just sit there until you advance it. Dust is the enemy, but look at that. Look at the pattern so you can almost see cool. the the valleys in the, uh, in the, in the depth of the disc there. I'm going to throw some lighting on it from flashlights at different angles, and the disc really, really pops. You can almost, it looks like you can almost see an image in there. Look at that. Isn't that cool? So those lines you see cutting across the picture, that would be the horizontal sink pulses. Horizontal sink and the, the burst. And then each one of those is one line of video. And they'd be 262 and a half for each of the larger vertical sink that, you, that I'll show in a minute here. But these ones, these are all individual horizontal sink, one line at a time. I'll try to get a little closer up view here, but uh, just wild. You can actually even see it on the microscope. Keep in mind that the video is actually FM encoded, as is the audio. So this is FMRF that you would see here on this disc, just the way it's pressed at different depths creates the capacitance yeah. effect for that FM carrier. So I figured, I, besides showing you guys what the stylus looks like, this is the actual record. I'm recording this on here, but this is so cool. I'll show you guys the shots right off the camera. I'm recording it right on this itself. That is just wild. I'm talking on the other camera as I was recording this, which I don't need to even show you that part. Under a microscope, then a because you're seeing it right off the microscope see camera. An image on there. These are individual, like individual lines, I guess, of video. That is wild. Now we're looking at the vertical blanking area. So this is black, this section. This is just black video during the vertical retrace. Of course, the horizontal sink keeps running during vertical retrace. Just the, the beam is blanked as it travels back to the top of the screen. Because remember, this is analog video. 
right? With digital video, you don't have to encode all this information because it's known. The uh, you know, when you record digital video, you don't you don't have to record your blanking interval. That's generated by the video processor. You just have to encode the actual visual information. But in the analog days, everything had to be encoded, including the black lines that occurred during vertical retrace. Start of the frame is on the left side of the screen. Now, those blue lines right in the middle, that would be the, the vertical VITS area, the vertical interval test signals, I'm sure. The two darker lines near the top of the screen, that's your, that's your uh, blanking. Disc rotates clockwise, so that would have been the start of the frame, and now we're looking at the end of the, the prior frame. This is the These would be the blanking signals at the end of the frame. That's the video, you can see it. And that other area we just saw, that would have been the sync area. And prior to that, the other one would have been the top of the, the next frame. This is pretty cool. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the, the actual look at the disc. I thought that disc was wild. You could almost see an image on there. If you felt you could probably get one, I don't think so, but it has stock number on it. I don't think you'd have much luck getting one of these today, but this just drops in like that. It only goes in one way. It just drops in like that, and then this cover closed down on it. And it says, this access compartment is for consumer replacement of stylus, cartridge only. Anyway, let's uh, get the top off this thing so we can uh, see what makes it tick. It probably, I don't know if it'll work with the disc. It might even, it might even spin like this with the, if I put, try putting the disc in with the top open, we might even be able to see the disc spinning. Let's try that. For the hell of things. Let's try putting the disc in. So, this goes in like that, this gets extracted like that, and then when I select play, you'll see the, this will start to spin. And it, like a regular record, it spins from the outside in. Which is opposite of the optical formats because they started from the inside out. Laser, CD, and DVD, and Blu-ray for that matter, all play from the inside out. Now, part of the big problem with these discs is you can see the disc almost looks like it's warped. As you can see this. That causes issues, and that was one of the reasons that these things didn't work out that well, because, well, the disc being vinyl, like any vinyl record, if they were stored incorrectly, if they got a little too warm or whatever, it would uh, cause some issues. And we'll just stop this thing from playing let's remove the disc once again and we'll see if i can get this disc player to work the guy that owns it would be thrilled if i could get it to work because it's, it's such a unique piece as i say if someone wanted to donate one of these to my collection i would certainly take it as long as i had a couple movies to go with it just to have something to play because i think they're kind of cool i would never buy one not for the not for what people are asking for this archaic technology today because I see see people asking a couple hundred bucks for them. And there's not a snowball's chance in hell these things are worth a couple hundred bucks. Um, if you can get that for it, I guess all the power to you. But um, they're more of a, it's cool. It's a museum piece. It's a display piece. That's how I would treat a piece of equipment like this. Is it's a display piece. It's not something to really be used. It's just something to kind of look at. Like put in a museum. Now this being RCA, I'm going to, Go out on the limb and say it's got quarter inch screws, which it does. I don't think there's any other screws in the back that take the top cover off. I think these quarter inch bolts have to come out and then this will lift off. But again, I've never opened one of these up. For the short period of time that we actually carried these at the shop, which was not that long, uh, I never saw any come in for service because, well, not too many people bought them. We had bunch we had them on display in the store we used to play movies on them in the store and you know try to sell them but again it was it was something that just didn't sell and that's why RCA pulled them off the market as quickly as they did and again RCA they lost their shirt on this I mean it was just an absolute disaster for the company so I'm going to zip out these screws Let's see whether the top cover will lift off yep three more in the back and then the top cover. And uh, lift off, it should. There we go. Okay, now you can see the guts of this unit. And it even has, well, it's not really a schematic. It just kind of tells you 
where you plug where you do test points where the fuses are and tells you what to grease too. You specified lubes only. Substitute lube may damage or impair operation. But it tells you the test points, the auto frequency tuning, resonator output, a servo vector bias. Cool. Tells you where the adjustment points are. And it even gives you I like this one here. Computer. Decoder. That's kind of wild. Like you don't see this stuff on the inside of stuff anymore. Current limiting. Clamp diode. 5 volt regulator. Squelch isolator. Printed in the USA, but where was it made? So, watch this. I hear squeaking. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. That might be part of the problem. Also, this, this I didn't see this try to advance, so maybe this is a, it's a belt drive over here, but it's not broken. But I didn't see this try to move. It seemed like it started to play a bit, and then it skipped back to the beginning. So probably this whole assembly is gummed up. But that, that's, that's, not, that's not good. That might be part of our problem. All right, what gives here? I see wires that are, like, those wires are cut. What the F? I think someone was, was trying to fix this thing. The wires that are cut go to this motor. And this is the motor that drives the the pickup back and forth and somebody's cut them so I think somebody probably tried to fix this thing and they probably cut those wires so that they could put a power supply on and see whether it moves we'll just put about I don't know five or six volts I don't know what voltage it needs so we'll turn the voltage down and we'll just apply some voltage to these wires and see whether this moves I've got it I've got it pla I've got the platform lowered does it move? Uh, I don't see anything happening there. Yeah, I don't see anything happening. I bet this motor shot. Because, uh, oh, there it goes. It just needs more voltage. Okay, let's hook it up the other way and see if this thing moves. Hmm. We can see the gear turning. But nothing's moving here. That should be moving it back there. Oh, maybe it only moves when it's in the uh, when it's in the in the uh, the play position. I bet it only moves. Yeah, okay. I don't want to move it. That works okay so first things first I'm going to uh, reconnect these wires that somebody conveniently cut for me because obviously it's not going to work with the, the the sled motor disconnected it's not going to go nowhere so let's fix that first and then we'll see if it even tries to read the disc and at least try to play something is it, there's an optical there's an optical encoder right here with a wheel with a bunch of slots in it if you can see them and I guess that that tells that provides feedback to tell the system where the uh, what position the stylus is in you see it's got a, a there's a variable resistor here that that turns while this moves you can see it so that's how crude this is. Has an optical encoder, and it also has a variable resistor that measures as this thing moves. I went to the post office today to mail back a few pieces that had been uh, repaired, 
and uh, I got raked at the post office. Holy crap! To mail back that that little radio, that little um, shortwave radio that I worked on last week. The postage charges to ship that little radio back was $77. To ship back the the um, two DAT machines in the one box was like 120, I think it was 128 bucks. And um, those are going to the States. But the two units that I shipped to Canada were a lot less money than the ones going to the States. But to, to ship back four small packages uh, I came out of the post office almost $300 lighter in my pocket just for postage. It's like, it costs more to ship the products than, it, than I made doing the repairs. Isn't that ridiculous? Okay, so I've, I've um, soldered up the two wires that were disconnected. I'm going to put the record back in and uh, we'll, we'll observe if anything different happens this time. So in goes the, the sleeve, out, out pops the sleeve, in stays the record, play. Will we see this gear turn over here, or will it not? Because this should turn to move the pickup in. <clears throat> As it attempts to play. funny it's not squeaking when it's running but so that could just be the brakes because when you shut it off it lowers it lowers it down and puts brakes on I'm gonna have to kill that sound just because uh, it'll probably pull a match we'll see if it plays any further than it did before or is it gonna skip back it's gonna still skip back to the beginning so that's probably what the guy was doing when he was uh, when he cut that wire he was checking to see if there was any drive voltage getting to the motor to move the motor and the motor's not moving so that's another problem that it's got uh, I guess if I oh no oh, there it goes haha <laughs> it just moved it just moved it was just maybe just sticking a bit because I just kind of flipped it a bit and away it went and now we're actually into the movie that droning sound you hear that coincides with the picture losing stability every time you hear that that droning sound it gets unstable. Okay, it's now turning. You can see that it's now turning, so maybe some lubricant on this will fix that problem. So I'll go grab my, my big uh, grease gun of uh, lithium grease and we'll throw some lube in here and see if that will get that part at least working. Hey, it's, it's playing now. It's not playing proper, but it's playing. See what I mean? Probably all that I can show. But we've, we've made some progress over what was doing before. It wasn't doing anything before, and at least I'm starting to get a color picture somewhat. Throw a bit of grease in here where uh, it could use it. I'll help it along by doing a scan. CED video just had a lot of disadvantages. For starters, they only recorded this one. 240 lines of or resolution. Some one scans. Just like tape. But they had a limited, limited playback of about 500 plays before the disc itself wore out. And you had to replace the stylus on a regular basis. If you didn't, it would actually wear your records down or disc down even faster. So there was a lot of disadvantages to a system such as this. I have to laugh. Somebody commented about them playing Barry White on the radio on the last video I was uh, doing, asking whether YouTube picked up on Barry White playing in the background. They're playing it again! It's like, what are we, in the 1970s? No, this station tends to play uh, a lot of the old stuff uh, on a regular basis.
I'll put some grease down on this this cog too. I guess I'm at the end of the disc now. So if I go back the other way. Now if I turn this to stop, what does it do? It shuts it off. Now, let's see what happens if I put it on pause. Pause, of course, stops it without a picture, which we expected. Uh, there's scan. Scan actually gives you a picture. This thing's actually starting to produce a picture, believe it or not. I, I wish I could show you more than a, a couple seconds, but once I, if I can get this thing to actually work, then uh, that's what I'll do. Let's just lower this down and see what happens. I say it's starting to produce a picture. That's where we're at now. I got stuck at the end there. Let's just watch the action of this gear here when the, when the pickup comes back. This should, uh, this is what should provide torque to get it unstuck so it doesn't stick. But what's happening is it's, it's winding all the way back and then when I try to go forward it just sticks. Unless I do this. Like it's not playing now, and if I just give that a flick, it will play. So it's it's um, it certainly is sticking. I do believe I have a worn belt. I'll have to see if I have one. I'm thinking I probably need a new belt here because when I when I scan, there's not a lot of torque. So this belt down here should probably be replaced. And I might even have one. If I remove this clip here, which I just did and just dropped it, it's in there somewhere. If I remove that I can probably push this forward like that, aha! Now I should be able to uh, now I can slip the belt off and slip a new one on and then pick that clip up with something, with a grabber of some type. Alright, let me just uh, Grab that belt. And uh, see if I've got another one of these. I've got another belt here that uh, hopefully is going to fit. That's the smallest one I have. So I'll just try putting this one back in and, and see whether it's going to do the job. Now, I can only get that around the motor shaft below here. Okay, I got the clip back on. Let's just uh, plug it in and see if it uh, is going to move on its own now or whether it's still going to stick. Hopefully it's not going to stick. Okay, play. Ah, good. It's not sticking. Well, it's looking a lot better than it was. We still got some servo problems, but uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's doing a lot better than it was when I first started, where it wouldn't even play. 
Now I just got to get that uh, servo synchronized for the. It would be the disc speed. I'm thinking that's all it is. Is this? It's either that or it's the. It's the maybe the disc warpage. Look at the disc. This is a. This is a great example. I mean, this is this is just a fluke that what you are seeing there is um, that's reflection from the lights reflecting on the disc, and they're strobing with the disc. But that is giving you an example. That's what we call jitter in the business. Now that could be that warpage of the disc. The disc itself, it's not sitting true. Like if I look at it, I can see the disc actually. You can see it there. And if I put my finger to the edge, you'll probably hear it tapping here. Can you hear it? Maybe you can't hear that. But I can certainly feel it. The disc itself has got a wobble to it. I like this. Warning or caution, do not remove this cover. The resonator circuit is not serviceable. If resonator circuit is defective, replace complete pickup assembly less the cartridge with stock number. And replace, remove the guide rail and slip assembly from the rail. So this whole assembly here, you can't replace, you can't repair this. There's no parts available. This is the servo, uh, servo balance adjustment. It's one of the few adjustments that you can make on this. I'm just going to turn this and see whether I can get this thing to, to lock in a bit better. Check this out. This has got a cleaner that cleans the stylus when you uh, when it returns back to stop, it cleans the stylus with this little felt pad. Check this out. It's an AC synchronous motor, belt driven. I don't know if I can lift it up a bit so you guys can see the belt. But um, it's an AC synchronous motor, like a record player, that spins the turntable or the platter. This is more like a record player than it is a piece of video equipment. There's no adjustments for speed. Speed is controlled by that belt-driven platter. It runs at a fixed speed all the way through. Neat, huh? Now, again, I, this, nothing surprises me on this unit because, again, the development for this started in the 1960s. 1964, to be precise. So there's, there's virtually no adjustments other than this this uh, servo balance adjustment there's virtually no other adjustments that stability is all controlled by the speed that this disc is spinning and any variation you can see there the disc has a warp in it that's probably why this disc is still is still skipping a bit which was always a problem it's one of the problems that plagued the CED format was the discs himself the discs wore out because they were essentially a vinyl record or like a vinyl record, the disc didn't last. And all it took was, you know, temperature, incorrect storage, and you get some warp on the disc, and you get a warp disc, and it's not going to track. This disc is tracking probably as well as it's ever going to track, which isn't great, but at least I can see a picture off of it. But I'm surprised it's even working, to tell you the truth. I'll take a look underneath this board. I think there might be an adjustment or two under here. I think I can flip this board up without shutting it down. What do we have on here? We have some transistors. That's what we have on this. And a couple of ICs. Stylus lifter adjustment. Not a lot on here to adjust, actually. There's, there's very, very little. Very, very little to actually physically adjust on this thing. I mean, really, it's nothing but a glorified record player. I find this so interesting, this old tech like this, because... It was, uh, not, it was manufactured, this was manufactured May 1981, and it was, RC, it was, it was made in the USA, Bloomington, Indiana. That's where this was made, this was USA made. It says so right on the sticker here. SFT100 is the model. Serial number 12131-6368. From that serial number you should be able to tell the uh, date of manufacture right down to the day. 
so the way RCA coded their serial numbers, the first letter was the year. So we know it's 1980, so 1981, 21st week of 1981, and that would make it May 1981, which is what's specified over here. And then it was the uh, day of the week. I think that's how it was. So the third day of the week, would have, Wednesday would be three. May 20th, 1981 would have been when this was made. Let's watch what happens when I put the uh, jacket back in here to remove the disc. It pushes the stylus back. That looks to be okay. I'll just try side two on the record. What's interesting is I'm watching the picture. I can't show it to you for because I'll get hit with copy, but as you hear that humming change, that's when the picture disrupts. It may have something to do with the fact that this disc is warped. You can see it warped. You can you hear that? Right? I just put my fingernail up against the edge of the disc. So that might be part of the reason why it's having such a problem tracking this disc. The player itself, although, appears to be working. Other than the fact that the belt needed to be changed for uh, the loading or driving the, the uh, pickup back and forth, it needed to be lubricated. It was all dried up. I'm just going to let the thing play here for a bit and see whether it, uh, whether anything improves with letting it run. Uh, I think this thing probably needs to be lubricated, this platter. I just don't know how to get at it at the moment. It's gotta be, there's got to be a bearing down here somewhere that I can access from someplace. Get to the motor here, no problem. That's easy to lubricate that. But the platter itself is uh, a different story. I can't even see it. I'll try pulling the bottom and see if I can get it. The bearings. Ah, another circuit board on the bottom. What do we got on here? Maybe there's some adjustments on this board. There's the there's the the uh, actual disc spinning motor right there. Just a regular AC synchronous motor. And the main spindle is right there. On the inside of the bottom cover, it's got a list of all the components on the circuit board here and what the adjustments do. Now one thing I didn't consider was stability on the plasma set. So let's just see how it looks on a CRT. As you can see on the CRT, it's much more stable. I've still got the color cutting in and out, but at least the uh, video is much more stable. Now I've not made any adjustments to this unit. I don't have a manual for it, so I don't know what adjustments to make or what the levels are supposed to be. I was just kind of looking at the board here and figured I'd plug it into the analog monitor, and it certainly is better on that. Uh, this stability problem with the, with the color, though, that could be, again, related to this disc, which is certainly warped. And that might be why the color is drifting as it is, is it might just be the disc itself that's causing that. But it's certainly interesting, that's for sure. What I am going to do is I am going to lubricate the, the actual spindle. So to do that, I'll remove the disc. And we'll unplug the power, of course. Flip the unit over. That way I can access the spindle at the bottom and we'll give, it a, give the motor some oil and give the spindle some lubrication on the black side of it here. And then I think all I can do is maybe just test it some more, maybe get a hold of the guy that owns it and get another disc brought out and see if it will play a different disc. Because again, it may we may have a disc problem just based on the fact that uh, that disc has got such a wobble to it. So that is the bottom of the disc bearing. I can actually get in there with some oil and we'll put a we'll put a little bit of oil right onto the bottom of that bearing. And I'm gonna do the same for the motor. Something else I didn't consider was the belt, the drive belt for the actual platter. 
it's been sitting probably for you know 40 odd years not being used the belt may have a flat spot on it so as the belt rotates there may be some slight wow basically as the belt goes over the area of the of the belt that is as has deteriorated bunch of dust in here. I wonder if I can pop this off and clean under this fan because there's a bunch of oh, felt down there. That's what it is. Anyway, we can put some uh, we can put some oil into this bearing. See, just an old an old-fashioned uh, four-pole turntable motor is all this is using. It's, it's a pretty simple device. I mean, old VCRs used to be the same. The, the drum motor on the old beta machines used to just use a single motor like this. I'll throw the main board back in. I'd like to know how much money RCA lost on every one of these machines that they sold. It was in the millions that they lost producing this machine that, of course, did not have any commercial success. According to Wikipedia, it was about $500 million that they lost on the development of this product alone. Now, had this video disc player reached the market before the VCR and there had been a supply of movies on this format, who knows, it might have actually succeeded. Development started in 1964. It took them 17 years to get a working model. So in 1981, when it launched, it was too little too late. They stopped production in 84, and the last of the movies were released in 86, and that was it. It was dead. But they were too late, too little too late, as they say. Late to the party, there was already VHS, Beta, and Laserdisc. So there just was not room for yet a fourth movie format, basically. And it couldn't record. And that was always a shortcoming for Laserdisc as well. The credits of Laserdisc would say it was great, it had the best picture quality, but it didn't record. And that was always the credits for that. One thing that bothers me is if this thing squeaks when it's spinning, I don't think it should squeak, but it does, whether it's up or down, it squeaks. It doesn't squeak when there's a disc in it, but it does when there's no disc. I'm just going to take this off. Will this clamp come out of the way? Remove that. And this clamp will probably lift out. There's the belt that drives the platter. Came off. Oh, that does. That comes up. Oh, there's more stuff under here. Looks like another place to lubricate under the spring. We'll just put a little bit of oil down there. Put that clamp back together. Let's see if that's where the squeaking was coming from. Well, that's certainly where it was coming from. It's coming from this. That's why it doesn't squeak when that's down. Okay, well, that might not be the cause of the, the problem, but again, when it's running, I can feel a vibration that occurs every time the uh, the color drifts in and out of the picture. There's a, there's a vibration that occurs. I don't think the drive belt is going to be an issue on this one. I mean, it's easy enough to take the drive belt out. It just comes out like that. 
I mean, that's the drive belt, but I don't see anything wrong with that. It's uh, nice and stretchy. So I don't think the drive belt is, is a problem. Let's put the belt back on. Put this bracket back in. You heard what I mean about the, the the humming changes. Well, that I can feel vibration, and when I feel that vibration and you hear that humming, that's when the stability changes. This is actually this is actually a very good view of the actual record, the disc. In the player in the in the power off mode so you can see if we turn the the disc around this is one full field that you see here those are the uh, synchronizing pulses that would be for um, full field because this does not rotate that fast it's not going at no 1800 rpm like a laser disc is this disc is actually rotating quite slow, 450 RPM by comparison. So this is probably an entire frame that you're seeing there. And those stripes that you see, that is the uh, vertical. So that's one full, one full field, the next field, etc. And as it rotates around, the stylus picks up the signal. I think each one of those each one of those stripes that you see that's one horizontal line, and this this big one you see here, that's the uh, vertical blanking interval. And if you were to count those, there's probably 262 between each one of those. Each one of those, each one of those sectors you see, would be a horizontal line. That would make up one full half of a frame, like a field, as it rotates. It certainly is starting to look a little better than when I first picked this unit up and basically all I've done is reconnect the motor that was disconnected and lubricate it there take a look at that can you see the needle that needle is just bouncing all over the place look at it It's just skating over the surface of the disc. It's not really riding in a groove like a like a phonograph needle because the bottom of it's flat, it's not pointed. It's just kind of sitting on the surface of the disc, reading the capacitance of the disc itself. See the disc being a capacitive disc, it's it's actually it's conductive. So there's a charge that's being read. There's a charge placed into the disc and it's being read by that stylus that's floating over it. 
course, every time that every time you see the uh, that needle jump, that's when the picture gets disrupted. That's when it gets shaky. It could be this bloody disc, because if you look at the wobble on that disc, there's a fair bit of like that disc has got a fair bit of of, of just wobble to it. I wouldn't say it's warped, but it certainly is not. It's not running flat, that's for sure. I think what I'll do on this unit, because the disc playback problems that I'm experience here, experiencing here, it could be this disc, as you can see. If you look at the disc, you can see that shimmy of the disc. So this disc has obviously got a warp to it at some point. And that is likely causing the tracking errors that I'm getting. It's playing. And I mean the, the stability of the picture is not too bad. Like I'll show you the picture again just for a split second here. As you can see, the, the picture stability is not too bad. The color is kicking in and out. And that could be the disc that's causing that. So I think what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna put this one together and I'll I'll put the video up. You'll you'll have seen it by now. I'm gonna get a hold of the guy that owns this one and get him just to drop off another disc or two. And um, we'll try it or he can take it and see whether it'll play as other discs because we may just have a bad disc I haven't made any electrical adjustments on here and I don't want to start touching any controls that I don't know what they do so basically it, this has just been mechanical lubricated the bearings lubricated the motor top and bottom bearing lubricated the spindle lubricated the gears that were seized up here and reconnected now the fact that those were cut is a good indication that you know somebody else obviously was in here trying to do something and they probably condemned it I mean, it still could have problems. It could have a problem with this. This assembly here it might be bad that you can't adjust. You can't even get into it. Um, so, I mean, it could still have some problems, but again, it could be the disc because when you see that the way that that disc is shaking like that, these were a terrible format when they came out. The reason why the disc was in a caddy like that was because dust would cause them to skip and they were terrible like even when they were out they were terrible after a movie's played a few times they do wear and then they have a problem tracking so it was a, it was a horrible format and that's why it died and say it's RCA pumped millions into this flop this is the Edsel of video players think of it that way anyway I'm gonna throw it together uh, we spent enough time on this one today I think it's real cool though you know, and if, if someone were to say, I have a player you could have for 10 or 20 bucks and some movies, I'd probably pick it up just as a collector's piece, just because these are really rare these days. And I like rare pieces, I like that Vinamagic projector with the Betamax player. I got that for free. That's about what it's worth. It's not worth anything. It's obsolete, but it's cool in its own way, and it's rare. And this certainly is rare. And of course, as I throw it together, something else I, I didn't even think about and consider this. And this could be the problem. It could be the stylus is worn out because they do wear out. It was a consumer replaceable component. I forget how many hours they were good for, but they weren't good for that long. And then you had to buy a new one and replace it. So that could be why it's not tracking. It might be a worn out stylus. In fact, if I were to guess as to what the problem with this unit is and why it's why the color is cutting in and out like that and why it's just not stable, like not perfectly stable, it's either A, the disc is warped, or B, the stylus is worn. I don't think this is, it could be the bearing too. Like, I mean, you see this, there's play, but that's in the unloaded position here. When it's in the, you see there's play here. So it could be the bearing under here because that was a part that would wear out under the platter. So it could be the bearing that's worn. It could be a, a stylus that's bad. It could be a bad record, video disc. Anyway, I think this is as good as I'm gonna get this. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I got the bottom on it now. I'll throw the top on it.
I figured out what the problem is on this unit after running it for a while. It's the, it's the bearing. If I press down on here and hold this down, my color stays on. Now I got color by just holding down on that spindle. Release it and it goes back to doing the same as it was doing before. And that's probably what's causing that disc to have that that a, a warp appearance. It's the bearing itself is gone and the actual the actual platter itself is shaking. You see, even when I press down there, you can see the disc moving. When I hold it down like that, now it's clear. And now the color cuts in and out again. We have a bad platter on this thing. So unfortunately, now we know what the problem with it is. It's not going to be fixable. And it's not going to be just a disc that's causing it. This unit is shot. Anyway, we tried. Thanks for watching.